Hello and welcome to the Genetics Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Short. My background is in population genomics and studying the genetic causes of rare disease. I did my PhD at the Sanger Institute and the University of Cambridge and have been in biotech since 2018 when I started Sonogenetics. Sonogenetics helps academic and industry researchers to run large-scale genetic testing programs that speed up their clinical trials, generate data sets for the next big breakthrough, and give participants the best possible experience taking part in research. Each episode of the Genetics Podcast, we bring you insights from the leading minds in genetics and precision medicine, including household names and Nobel Prize winners, as well as early career scientists and biotechs working on the next big breakthrough. Whether you are a scientist, entrepreneur, executive, patient advocate, or simply someone curious about how genetics shapes our world, you're in the right place. Thank you for listening, and let's get started. Welcome, everyone, to the Genetics Podcast. I'm really excited to be here for the second time with Kira Deneen, who is a prenatal genetic counselor and host of the incredibly popular podcast, DNA Today, which I think as of this recording has more than 275 episodes. So it's pretty amazing effort, more than twice the number here. So if you get sick of episodes of this podcast, then you've got twice as many you can go listen to over with Kira. And you actually started that podcast in 2012 when you were still in high school. Isn't that right? I would love to hear the backstory there. Uh, Pretty amazing. And you've been going strong now for 12 years. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Short. Yeah, it's always fun recording with you. You've done a couple episodes on DNA today, one about the genetics of ALS. And we recently, or that was the recent episode. And then we did the episode about the genetics of autism. So I'm sure we could throw that in the show notes for this episode. But yeah, so I, I started the show In 2012, you did your homework, (laughs) you got it. And yeah, I was a senior in high school and I kind of saw it as an opportunity to be holding myself accountable to learning more about genetics. I knew I wanted to go into genetics and I was learning about careers. I was interested in genetic counseling. I wasn't sold on it yet. So I was like, okay, what are different career opportunities and paths that I could take? And I figured as a high schooler, most genetic professionals would not take a meeting with me to be like, I want to learn about things. Usually they save those for college students, understandably. But I was like, well, maybe if I'm interviewing them on a show, they'll say yes. So it was a very kind of selfish move at the beginning of just being able to network and and start building those relationships. So yeah, it was just kind of a, a good way to just be learning about genetics and learn with my audience. So yeah, now we're like 11 years later and I'm a practicing genetic counselor. So I think it's been fun to just be able to now provide a little bit of insight when I have guests on as opposed to, you know, 10 plus years ago when I was really not knowing what guests would say. I mean, certainly that can be the case sometimes, but other times I'm like, okay, I kind of know this area somewhat. But yeah, so the, the vibe of the show has changed a lot over the years, just in terms of my education and kind of what I can bring to the show. Yeah, it's amazing how much you learn between the prep and then hearing what they actually say. It is it's it's a really good way to learn. And and it was the reason I started the genetics podcast as well. Just having not not to decide about the career per se, but to have conversations with people that would be very difficult to have otherwise. And you've had 275 of them. What would have been some of the highlights? Who who or what or what kind of topics have been most um, Yeah. For you? Oh my gosh, so many. I think one that comes to mind first is talking to the a couple of the descendants of Henrietta Lacks. Oh, yes. So I don't know if you guys have talked about Henrietta Lacks on the show, but for those that may not be familiar, Henrietta Lacks was a Black woman who died from cancer. And when she went to Johns Hopkins for treatment, the doctor basically took a sample of her cancer and was able to grow that in the lab. And using Henrietta Lacks cancer cells, they were able to figure out how to culture cells. And if you think about the downstream effects of that, it's just mind-blowing how much has come out of scientific research in medicine from us being able to grow cells in a lab and figure out, oh, these cells grew better when we added this type of growth media versus something else. And so I think that all, all of the following research that came from that is just, I mean, mind-blowing. So it was just such a cool opportunity. I got to meet them in person. They oh, wow. came to my university with the author of the book, Rebecca Sklu, who wrote The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. And she spent like a decade with the family and you know her children and, and grandchildren to really learn about 
you know, Henrietta Lacks' life. And, and there was very, very little known about her before Rebecca Skloot went on this journey. And I, I really respect her in so many ways because I originally had asked, oh, you know, who's available for an interview? I'd love to interview the author, Rebecca Skloot. And she said, you know, I, I I will politely decline. I leave all the interviews to her relatives. And I was like, wow, that is just wow, amazing that she... Yeah. Yeah, so classy. And so that was just really cool to hear directly from them on their grandmother and great grandmother's legacy and just how much our medical field has not really honored and respected Henrietta Lacks's story and what she has contributed to science as much as I would have liked. There have been changes over the years, some, you know, uh, court cases and things that have led to a little bit more. But yeah, that was just kind of a star, starstruck moment for me of just like, wow, you're sitting in front of people that, you know, are in this family. And that was very early on. I think that was before yeah. we reached episode 50 or something like that. So I don't know if I was a great interviewer wow. at the time, but yeah. And and that is by far my favorite book. Yeah. I don't know if you've had the, I, I read the, the book too. Of reading it. Okay. I yeah. Read the book. I really liked it. And, and I, yeah. they, that there was, you know, was uh, her cells were taken in a coercive way, right? And I think they yes. recently won a lawsuit. I don't think the amount was disclosed, but it seems like there's finally, at least, uh, you know, hopefully yeah. they're they're happy with what they received. But you know, it doesn't undo the the coercive nature of it. But it at least yeah. uh, closes the loop a little bit on hopefully the family got something that they should have gotten a hundred years ago. Yeah, exactly. There was a lot of I think in terms of if there are students listening that there are there's so much to learn within this book not just on her story but just the ethics and things that really went wrong and we need to look back and say how can we make sure and prevent these situations from happening again of a lot of miscommunication of the family thinking that she was alive at one point because they were talking about her cells growing and and they wow. were not explaining it in a way that was accessible and understandable to the family who had various levels of education. And, and so I think there's just so much to learn from it. But I mean, it it's just a laundry list of how much that her cells have, have impacted vaccines. And I mean, her cells have gone to space. Like, I remember when I was a student and, you know, student in a lab and kind of going through the freezer for something and seeing like HeLa cells because they take uh, the first same. two letters of the first and last name and being like, and just holding it for a minute and being like, so I think that definitely was one of my, my favorite opportunities to be able to speak with them. Yeah. yeah. I think that's episode 34. I should really look that up, but good memory. Um, so what, what <laughs> about number two? Do you have a number two or number three that you really like? Yeah. So I think another moment that was cool was I, in high school, watched the show Glee. So it was on Fox and it's, you know, about Glee Club for people that are younger than me that maybe didn't watch it at the time. <laughs> and so one of the characters on Glee has Down syndrome. And so the actress does as well. And she came on the show. And so we were able to kind of talk about just all of her advocacy work. Her name is Lauren Potter. She pay, plays Becky Jackson on Glee. So she's kind of Sue Sylvester's right-hand woman. And she's in all six seasons of the show, played by Jane Lynch there. But yeah, so Lauren Potter just really talked about how it meant so much to her that she became a role model for the Down syndrome community. And just so many people reaching out and being like, wow, like, you know, my daughter or my son or whoever like watches you and really looks up to you and, wow. and you're showing that you can have a successful career and that people with Down syndrome can, you know, do just about everything. It's been really exciting, I think, in recent years to see so much of like, you know, the first person with Down syndrome that, you know, achieved X, Y, Z, you know. So I think that was a, a really cool interview of just being able to hear from her and just, you know, anytime you like watch a TV show and you get to talk to one of the actors, you're like, whoa, this this is this is a cool moment. So yeah, and she was just she is so much like her character in the sense of just being like sassy and she is just has so much personality. She's just a little firecracker. So I really really enjoyed talking with her and just also learning a little bit of behind the scenes with Glee and she's still close with the actress that she shared the most scenes with Jane Lynch and you know, they're always kind of talking on their birthdays and everything. So I think that was cool just to hear from her and I mean, she was recognized by I believe Obama and for her different advocacy efforts. So her advocacy goes beyond just her acting career of doing a lot of things with other organizations kind of within the Down syndrome community. Yeah, that's super. Another great example. I'm curious how you prep and learn and what your process is, because I think that this is obviously a podcast or asking about podcasting, but <laughs> yes. I also think there's there's more general 
info in here of like you see such a wide range of different people from different backgrounds and you have limited time in a day or week to prep and and if you over prep then the episode can come across really wooden right so I'm, I'm curious of how you get up to speed quick enough in a new area to ask good questions and have that conversation but don't overboil it yeah yeah oftentimes i used to like watch interviews with that person and i've actually stopped doing that because then i'm like i'm gonna ask the same question so i i've kind of switched how i prep a little bit more but just being able to read a little bit more about the person of whatever information is out there and also about whatever they're coming on to talk about so like you know diving a little bit i'm more into the down syndrome community i mean i'm also a prenatal genetic counselor so that's something that i'm talking about on a routine basis so i guess that one is a little bit more of one that i'm more familiar with but i think just kind of seeing like what is uh, available, you know, about this person. I always, you know, even though I've I've been podcasting for 12 years, I always prep every interview. I think you've seen that just being a guest on the show that um, I don't go in blind. I, I go in kind of sharing some interview questions ahead of time that I have in my mind, but it's it's certainly not a script. It's more of just like, hey, this is where my head is at going into the interview. Like, are we on the same page? Okay. And, and letting curiosity take over too, because I think that you know, turns into a very authentic conversation and it makes it just much more real in the moment. And you kind of feel like it's more of kind of like, a, you know, you're chatting over coffee and as a listener, you're just more involved in it in that way and engaged. But I think, you know, also just making sure with guests that they feel comfortable with the questions that I have in mind. You know, we used to do it live, but we don't do it anymore. So, you know, knowing that we can cut something yeah. if I ask a, a question that they don't feel comfortable with. But I think that's really important for the patient advocates, you know, so, you know, with Lauren Potter and other people that I've had on the show, making sure that that's, you know, something that they feel comfortable with if they have talent agents or other managers, like making sure that they're in on it and often having them on the call as well. I think that's really important for, you know, certainly minors and also people that have some form of intellectual disability that we just really want to make sure that we're making them feel comfortable and that what we're asking is certainly appropriate. So I think that's kind of an area I think about when interviewing people that are more in, you know, within that spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's, and yeah, it is a remarkable what a difference the recording versus live makes. Just saying to people, we can edit. If you don't like what you said, we'll chop the whole thing out. That's That goes a really long way for almost everybody, right? Very few people oh, are yeah. totally comfortable on the live and unscripted stage. Yeah, right? I think disarming people is something that's so important. I think I used to just jump into things. But especially if I don't know that person, I'm like, let's take a couple minutes just to chat and, you know, make sure that they are like, oh, okay, Kira will take me through this. And, you know, so I think that is an important part to not to not skip if you don't know that person. If you've recorded before, like we have, we can just hit record and go, right? Yeah. Dr. Short, like, we didn't, though. We're we still, good. we, we still did caught talk, up and though, broke because the I'm ice. always yeah. like, what's happening? And it's only been like a week since we talked. But yes, I think that's always an important part. And, and even within genetic counseling, I think there's a lot of parallels that, you know, I learned through podcasting that I brought into my skills as a genetic counselor that when I'm meeting with a patient, I don't just jump in right away. You kind of want a little chit chat at the beginning you know, introducing yourself and, and kind of just seeing where they're coming from. So I think that there's been a lot that being a, a podcaster has made it a, a much easier transition to or an addition, I guess, to become a genetic counselor. I think that made it a little bit easier when I was, you know, in grad school, starting role plays and beginning, you know, it's obviously yeah. going to be awkward and you're figuring out your footing. But at the same time, I think it was a little bit easier because I was like, I'm just going to pretend it's like a podcast interview, <laughs> you it's know, so when I was true. approaching patients. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you've got to ask good, well-prepped, open-ended questions, right? And really let people let people lead the way. I didn't think about it that way, but it makes total sense. Yeah, yeah. I definitely wrote and talked about that a lot. And when I was doing my interviews and trying to get into grad school, I was like, yeah. all right, this is this is my 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 elevator pitch. <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to ask about that. So in 2012, you were in high school and you were thinking about becoming a genetic counselor. When we last did, um, did a crossover episode like this, I actually think you were maybe matching or you were just figuring out what you were going to do because this was back in 2019. And now you're a prenatal genetic counselor. How how has the podcast how did the podcast in the early days help you make that decision and 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 then how did you make the decision to specialize in in prenatal tell us a little bit about what you Yeah. What you so I mean I think being able to have the podcast and interview so many genetic counselors I felt like I had a really good grasp on what their day-to-day -day work life looked like and is this something that I can see myself doing and also, I think part of it is, does this feel like a community that I fit into? So I think that was important of just like, do I feel like genetic counselors, like I'm similar to them? 
you know, certainly not everybody, but do I feel like I really connect with them? Do I feel like there's a lot of similarities in terms of like the different skills that we have and, you know, the way our brains think? And so I think that was really important. And just a lot of my interviews led to shadowing opportunities. And there's a lot of downstream effects of being able to like have those interviews. One of the aspects of genetic counseling that there was a little time period where I was like, I'm not going to pursue genetic counseling. And, you know, it's probably like, you know, a month or two. And during that time, I was like, you know, I don't want every day I am delivering sad or negative news to people. Cause I picture, yeah. I was like, if that's going to be my every day, that's going to be like, how is that going to affect my mental health? You know, just my attitude. And I, I was concerned about it. I grew up, my mom is a social worker. So I was certainly exposed to like that, that counseling type of profession. And, and she has really found it to be a very rewarding career. So I, I was interested in it from that perspective, but I was like, well, you know, my mom doesn't deliver bad news most of the time. That's pretty rare for her. Right. It's more processing what's going on in someone's life. And so, you know, I was concerned about that, but, you know, I, and I don't know if it was my mom or someone kind of said, well, you know, they're going through this experience, whether I'm involved or not, I'm not mm -hmm. causing something, which I know sounds simple, but when you are delivering news, yeah. you kind of feel like, oh, I'm the one that made this happen. Right. And taking yourself out of that and saying, okay, they're going to be experiencing this regardless, but I can actually help them have a better experience and feel like there's someone that's advocating for them, someone that's helping be sort of a guidance counselor like through this process and being able to answer questions and educate them, but also do that counseling part of processing their emotions and, and how difficult this is and what does your support system look like? And once I switched my perspective on that, I was like, okay, I think this is a field that I want to go into. So I think a lot of people experience that where they're like, okay, I'm not sure about this because of that aspect. And I hear that from a lot of applicants or people that are prospective students. And they're like, I don't know, is it just going to be really sad? And it also depends on what specialty you go into and also what specific job you go into. So some of my friends, like one of my friends works in pediatric oncology. Her day to day is definitely much you know, somber compared to mine. Yeah. I see in my particular position, I see a lot of patients that they do have normal testing. You know, everything is pretty typical. So my every session is not a very, you know, sad kind of heavy session, but some prenatal genetic counselors do have that. So it's, it's the specialty, but also the specific role you have. So I think that, you know, all kind of played a role into like, am I going into genetic counseling and what specialty is going to be more fitting for me? Yeah, that's a, that was a super valuable. Was it your mom that reframed it in that way? I want to say it was. Yeah. yeah. If it was someone else, definitely let me know and I'll give you credit, but probably my mom. <laughs> yes, shout out to mom for that. Yeah, yeah shout, shout out to mom. Yeah. That's really good. So you work mostly with families with uh, after genetic testing turns out to be relatively low risk pregnancy, right? But maybe you could talk a little bit about the process in you know, and where, where you practice, where, when do families get genetic testing? Maybe you can talk a little bit about the spectrum and, and prenatal is quite an interesting part of the journey because it is a, it's a decision to even do the testing in the first place, right? You need to do amniocentesis. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that process because that's in and of itself yeah. a big decision. Yeah, it definitely is. And and I know that you're a parent, so you've experienced kind of going through, you know, pregnancy with your partner and everything. And and so I think when it comes down to it, it's like, you know, at least I can speak more to the US and then, you know, maybe you could fill me in a little bit more on the UK. But, you know, in the US, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology recommends that all pregnant people are offered genetic screening. So there's a bunch of different types of genetic screening. You know, nowadays, pretty much everybody is doing non-invasive prenatal screening. So NIPS, some people say NIPT for testing instead of screening. So with this type of screening, it is a simple blood draw, one tube for most labs. And there doesn't need to be an indication other than you're pregnant. So it used to be that insurance companies wouldn't really cover it unless you were 35 or older at delivery. But now that has really changed as, you know, you've talked about a lot here on the Genetics Podcast that the cost of testing has plummeted over the years. And that's led to a lot of the cost reducing and then the accessibility goes up. So kind of just, you know, the effect of that 
And so because of that, for a couple hundred dollars or less, people can have this genetic screening. And what we're looking at, for the most part, is extra missing chromosome conditions. So we were talking about Down syndrome a little bit earlier. And so for that would be the most common condition on this screening panel. And there's other conditions like it. So we can do this now. It's called screening. So the way I explain results to patients is that we can get a high chance for a certain condition or a low chance for all the conditions. And one of the reasons I phrase it with chance is because I find it to be a neutral term instead of using the term risk. That really bothers me when people say, oh, well, you know, your risk for Down syndrome is is it came back high. It's 90 percent mm. that you're automatically putting this negative connotation on the word. And uh, I don't think it's our job to be interpreting that for people. So but it's important to know, like it's it is chance levels and it's not a yes or no answer. But you mentioned like an amniocentesis or CVS that's in the base of testing. So we're not talking about blood draws anymore. Now we're talking about, you know, either taking a needle most of the time through the stomach and taking a sample of the fluid or a sample of the placenta to test. And that is a a yes or no answer. Does baby have Down syndrome? Does baby not have Down syndrome? Nowadays, most people don't end up doing that invasive testing because the blood screening is so good. So most people get normal results back. And I kind of put that in quotes, like normal where there's a low chance for all genetic conditions that were included in the screening. And, you know, we're going with this Down syndrome example. For that, it would be less than one in 10,000 chance that that screening missed that baby actually does have Down syndrome. And most people feel comfortable with that number and aren't looking to pursue invasive testing at that point because there's a risk for a miscarriage and, and other considerations with that. So yeah, most people just do the blood screening and then they have normal results and they kind of leave it there. But, you know, different things can come up where it becomes more involved and I'm more involved with that person. And are you in, so we've done like, you know, we've done the Terra tests and these kind of things that I think are the the kind of ones you're talking about. Is there typically a pre-test counseling session in most of those cases, or do you normally get involved afterwards? How, what is the, what does that normally look like pre and post, just post depending on the results? Yeah. So it more depends on the referring provider. So some of our patients are in-house. So they call us and say, hey, I have a positive pregnancy test. And we take them all the way through all of their pregnancy appointments, delivery, postpartum appointment. We'd be like, okay, how are you recovering from delivery? How is baby? So some people, we do everything. So I kind of think of them as like in-house patients. And then other patients have a different OB somewhere else, but their OB doesn't have a genetic counselor. So I serve as kind of their offsite genetic counselor. And their OB may not have the top-notch ultrasound machines and top-notch like educated certified ultrasonographers. So they often come to us for an ultrasound and then chat with me afterwards. So in those cases, a lot of times they've already had the testing. I'm reviewing it with them. But for our in-house patients, I talk with them beforehand, be like, hey, here's all our options, like what questions you have about this. If they've been pregnant before and did the screening before, I'm like, hey, like, you know, do you want me to review for you? Do you feel like you remember all this? I don't want to bore you. And, you know, so it's very much tailoring what a patient needs and how much their partner knows or a support person that they bring. So that's a lot of it of just kind of tailoring what's there. But certainly we get lots of people that, you know, maybe it's a new doctor I haven't worked with before, but something comes up that's different with the testing and comes back with a higher chance for condition. And they're like, okay, this is, you know, involved. I don't know this condition as well. Maybe it's something like Kleinfelter syndrome that maybe they're not as well versed as Down syndrome. And they say, let's have you talk to a prenatal genetic counselor instead. Yeah, that makes sense. My experience in the UK is fairly similar, although the the panel that's offered as standard in the health service is much more limited. And I mean, there's maybe a discussion. I don't know the data. Maybe you do, but there, there uh, is the is the jury still out on the sensitivity and specificity of the longer list of chromosomes and micro deletions? I mean, I think there's a there's at least you know some some people speculate that adding the additional micro deletions and things may throw up more false positives than you than, than you necessarily want. But it's broadly a similar situation, although I don't think anybody that I'm aware of in the UK has offered pre-test counseling. It's kind of they they whip out the form in the middle of the ultrasound yep. and say, would you like this? Uh, yeah. Um, Stick out your arm. Let's do the blood draw sign exactly. here. Exactly. Yeah. I think it's certainly if we're comparing the extra missing chromosome conditions, especially the core conditions. So trisomy 13, 18, 21, 21 is Down syndrome. Those, we just 
have so so much data on. So the statistics behind it is much more powerful. You know, some of the conditions you're talking about, like micro deletion conditions where we're missing a chunk, a small chunk of a chromosome instead of an entire chromosome. That is definitely like the specificity and sensitivity is certainly less if we're comparing it just because their N number, the number of times they've seen it and been able to validate it and all that is going to be less because those are more rare diseases compared to Down syndrome. So I think that's a big part of it, but they also rarely come up. So I think it's something that for my patients, I certainly talk about it. Most of the time we end up ordering it because a lot of my patients are kind of in that boat of information as power. If something comes up, we'll talk about it more than I'd rather have it kind of be something that we are able to dive further into rather than something that could be there that we don't find and we could have screened for. So I think that's part of it. But knowing like some patients will say, or like maybe they read about it. There was a New York Times article a couple years ago that for like two months, everybody was like, I don't want micro deletions because I, I found this article to be, it, it wasn't very clear and it was misleading in terms of how the micro deletions that we can pick up on. It's not as, you know, as we said, like there's not as much data behind it to really yeah. give good statistics there. So yeah, it was an interesting conversation for like two months with patients that were reading that article. And, you know, it was like, it was like the first article of that year. It was like the first week of January kind of thing a couple of years ago. And I was having lots of people send it to me and I was like, yep, I need to read this, take notes because patients are going to be asking me about it and everything. Yeah. I wanted to get your perspective on actually chat bots, large language models, AI in genetic counseling. I suspect it's something you talk about and think about a lot and and have some perspectives on maybe to parameterize the question a little bit, where are there some parts of the field where you say, actually, we can really safely do a lot of good here? And then where are some parts in the in the maybe column and then some definitely not now? Yeah, I think when it comes to chatbots, I think there's a time and place for them. I'm also relatively young. So I think just, you know, coming from that, you know, just made the cut for millennial that my perspective is, okay, like, you know, chatbots and AI, like this is a tool that we need to use to be more efficient, to do all these things. I certainly use it and I'm writing emails and, and lots of little shortcuts. I think one thing with it is if on the genetic counseling side and provider side, really making sure you're not putting any HIPAA sensitive information into it. So patient identifiers, which at first you're like, yeah, of course. But when you're talking about like in the rare disease space, just a little information could be a patient identifier. So I think that's something to really think about on the provider side. But I think it's great. I talk with students all the time that, you know, if they're like, you know, I'm having trouble explaining this concept to patients. I'm like, put it into ChatGPT, um, Gemini, whatever you use and say, hey, explain this in three different education levels. And maybe you can get some phrasing out of that and kind of workshop it. So I think there's a lot of ways that we can be using it like on our side even to help you write consult letters and different things like, oh, write me a blurb about, you know, trisomy 18. If that's something that you really know and you read through, they're like, yep, everything is correct. And it just went faster instead of you stand, sitting in front of a blank screen. Like, okay, what am I writing? What do I remember? So I think it's good for generating content, but not for copy paste, we're done. Like it is, yeah. it is a draft. You know, I think on the patient side with chatbots and all this, that's certainly been something that I think as a field we've been talking about for 10 plus years, but with AI becoming so much better in the last 18 months, I think that's something that we're going to see more and more. And I, I think it it can be helpful of like, you know, FAQs, like, oh, like what is non-invasive prenatal screening and giving you that like little blurb about it. But I think when it comes to personalizing a patient's experience and more that white glove approach, how much is a chatbot really going to be able to do? And I think when it comes to the emotional part, so I think that counseling part, that psychosocial part, like as great as robots can be in all of this, I think that's where, at least right now, they very much lack. Who knows in our lifetime and our careers, Dr. Short, like where it's going to be able to go? Is it going to be a better psychosocial counselor than me? Maybe. But I think that's things that I think about of like having that baseline information that maybe patients can learn a certain amount so that when they go into a genetic counseling session, they're not necessarily learning all of this new, but they've been able to ruminate a little bit on it. So they're like, hey, I was thinking about this and this is my question. So I, th I think it can be helpful in those ways. And I mean, I'm excited to see where it goes, but I don't think it's going to replace genetic counseling. I think just like everything else, our, our positions and our job responsibilities are just going to be adapted a little bit more to 
be able to streamline a lot of that administrative work that is like the ugh part of the job. Yeah, completely. One of the things that I've won, like every everybody that you can't even mention genetic counseling without somebody pointing out how rare you all are and how scarce it is and how challenging it is to find one almost everywhere. And that to me, you know, begs the question of if we, if a chatbot is, you know, if an LLM is good enough at answering accurately some, you know, the top hundred questions that people ask, could you have a system that helps with that? And I, I just imagine though that we're probably going to end up in the same kind of situations that we have with autonomous vehicles self-driving cars that yes societally we have an extremely high bar we're not willing to accept an autonomous vehicle that's just as good as the average human or even the 90th percentile human we have an extremely high barrier and i sort of feel like we're going to have the same thing here because the tolerance for error when it's a human, we 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 a human's error. I, I'm sure that was Shakespeare, or somebody who said that. But uh, <laughs> yeah. we we don't have that kind of tolerance for machines that do something humans do. So I I don't know if I, I don't know if that's right or wrong, but it is. It seems to be a little bit of a fact of society right now. Yeah, and I think when it comes to it too, like a big part is we did an episode uh, with actually a buddy of mine, and he wrote a book about you know, computer vision. So just as you're saying, like self-driving cars and, and things where computers are using cameras to be able to perform tasks. And and it's just so interesting because we talked about like how we could be using this in the genetic space because that's kind of like where the two of us, you yes. know, collide in terms of our careers. And I think it just has so much potential right now. But it's also like bad data in, bad data out. So when you are asking chat GPT something, right? Like it only has information up to a certain point. Maybe in the near future, we're going to have it be able to, you know, scour the internet for articles that were posted yesterday. But right now it's only up to a certain point. So you can't ask it, what are the top news stories of the week? And in genetics, that's really important, right? Like we see how much have changed. I think especially you, Dr. Short, who, you know, is, is leading this company and you have to keep up on so many different aspects of genetics and also being able to interview people. You're learning so much through these interviews. And how much can a chat bot kind of keep up with all this and make sure that it's filtering out the bad data? So I think that's one thing that I think if companies develop their own and they're feeding it specific genetic information, peer-reviewed journal articles, things that are, are validated information, that could be great. But if it's just scouring the internet for someone on Reddit is talking about a genetic yeah. condition and they're getting it wrong, it's like now we're giving that to a patient, lawsuits. I mean, it's going to be really interesting. But one area that I think it could be really helpful with, and, and I talked about this with my friend Rob on that episode, is giving it information on, let's say, pictures of phenotypic features. So maybe a picture of a person's face that has some, you know, differences in their face, facial features. So what we kind of in the medical textbooks refer to as dysmorphic features and saying, okay, let's have it look at all of these images and figure out what disorder is it. So there's some very rudimentary, I think face to gene is one of them that kind of does this. But I think that's like an AI tool, computer vision, where that could really change things, especially in the pediatric space. I don't work in the pediatric space, but, you know, I mean, and this this spans out to could you give it images of cells and say, is this cancer or not? What type of cancer is it? So I think, you know, we're already kind of starting to see that and doing studies on, you know, is this skin cancer? Is it not? Is it a mole? You know, so I think there's a lot that goes into all of that. But the the future is, I mean, it's, it's just going to change the way that we approach genetics and being able to personalize it more. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to change a lot of things. I am. Um... I think yeah, we're 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 doing the best to get ahead and figure it out, but sometimes it's unpredictable, right? And you have to see where the technology leads you. What what other things are you interested in that are changing the field? I mean, you have such a unique insight because you're both working in the field, but you also interview not just genetic counselors at the top of their game, but people in genetics and precision medicine more widely. What other kinds of things are you excited about or interested in? Yeah. I mean, so the end of every year we do like, you know, how Spotify does their wrapped and you see who's your top artist and all of that. And, you know, half the world gets Taylor and, you know, so we do a genetics wrapped, which is really fun. We have Dr. Eric Green on from the NIH on every year. And then we're starting to do the outgoing president of American Society of Human Genetics. And so just kind of interesting to see, okay, well, what were the big news stories this year? And for 2023, 
my top news story was we now have FDA approved drug using CRISPR technology to, I want to say essentially cure, but I'll use the word treat sickle cell. I figured I'd see this in my lifetime. I did not think I would see it when I was still in my 20s. I thought, oh, okay, I'm going to be in my 50s, 60s when I see this. You know, maybe I was being pessimistic, but that is huge. And I think the fact that it's for a condition that is oftentimes overlooked, it affects a lot of people in the world, sickle cell, and that it affects a lot of people that have African ancestry. I think that it's just it's just so wonderful that we have this FDA approved treatment. I mean, it still blows my mind and it's been months that, you know, this is, has been in the news. Yes. Yeah. And, and I just, you know, I think you probably know a little bit more about that space than I do, but looking at, okay, well, what's next? Like what condition? And, you know, I think for sickle cell, it made sense that that was one of the first in terms of being able to take someone's bone marrow out, as I say, kind of crisper up the cells and, essentially, you know, edit the genetics so that they don't have sickle cell and able to produce normal red blood cells. I think that made sense. You can't necessarily just take someone's lungs out and crisper them up for like, say, cystic fibrosis. So I think it, you know, kind of makes sense from that perspective. But I think just so, you know, we, we did an episode about kind of just how there's so much more research and re finances and venture capitalism and all of this in the cystic fibrosis community compared to sickle cell and sickle cell affects way more people. Not to say cystic fibrosis is not important all that very much is, but I think just in terms of in our healthcare field, it's like when conditions affect people of non-European descent, unfortunately, there's a lot of areas where it does not receive the amount of dedication that I think it should. So I think there's just so many reasons why I'm just very happy that sickle cell was was the first condition. Yeah, I think I I completely agree. We do a similar rap with uh, my friend Vera Rajagopal, who is, have you, do you, are you on Twitter? Do you follow him on Twitter? Possibly, yes. I'm not always yeah. scrolling through Twitter, but now yeah. and then, yes. He's, he, he amazes me. He has just an encyclopedic knowledge of all things genetics, but he writes these tweet threads and now he has an email substack where he does a newsletter oh, as well. Fun. So yeah. yeah. It's fun. Yeah, I'll it's have to stay updated to... on that. That sounds like a great resource for me. Yeah. Yeah. He's no, he's brilliant. And and he has, yeah, he's I think he's just like, I don't know, I don't know he how he reads so many papers so thoroughly so often, but but it's good. It's great to have people like him in the world. Yeah, I commend him. I'm not able to do that. I'm I definitely read abstracts. I don't always read full papers. I yeah. will admit that because everybody does. <laughs> yeah. Except yeah. him, I apparently. <laughs> no, we have I guess we have Chat GPT to help us to help us now. That is true. Summarize. That is true. Um well this was fun as always. If if people want to listen or watch DNA today, maybe you can tell them a little bit about where to find you and and stay up to date on the latest of the podcast. Yeah, definitely. Wherever you're listening now to the Genetics Podcast, you can find us. If you just search DNA Today, we're the green logo. You know, I, I found that our two podcasts kind of pop up pretty early. So, you know, props to us. You know, we've got that SEO down, I guess. But yeah, so where, wherever you are listening to podcasts, we're also on YouTube if you like to watch podcasts. I'm someone that just likes listening, honestly, because I'm always doing other things. So I'm always yeah. surprised. Like, I'm like, people actually watch the podcast? Yeah. They must have um, YouTube premium or something where you can shut your phone and not get the ads. Uh, I, I couldn't. Maybe. I, I have a YouTube regular and I can't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I defi definitely don't pay for YouTube myself. But <laughs> yeah, so, and we have lots of lots of interesting episodes. A lot, you know, we kind of we're, were diving into here today with Dr. Short. But yeah, we've covered a lot of different things in the last 11 years. And if there's something we haven't covered, you know, I'm sure the Genetics Podcast has. And if neither of us has covered it, then reach out to us because then yeah. we should do a crossover and both cover it again. <laughs> we need to we need to get it together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like between us, we've got like, you know, probably close to 500 episodes. We got, yeah, we got 500 yeah. now. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, here's to the next 500, right? <laughs> That's right. Exactly. How do you do weekly, multiple times a week? How, how often? Yep. Every Friday we release. Yep. Right. So we've been doing that for uh, a few years now. So it used to be twice a month and then we kind of upped it once right. I graduated and could uh, focus on a little bit more so yeah we just yeah. we just upped it to weekly in 2020 i noticed so that yeah we do thursdays so you can listen to us on thursday yours on Perfect. friday or both of them on your if you run for a 90 minutes on saturday then you got them both so we're we're yes. happy to share if you like one you'll probably like the other yeah yeah our, sh our shows have very similar vibes definitely yeah. definitely awesome well thank, well, thank you, thank you so fun. much
much. Yes. My yeah. Pleasure. Yeah. It's always just so great talking to you, Dr. Short. You're just a wealth of knowledge and just so easy to talk to. You're, you're a good podcast host. You too. You too. It's absolutely <laughs> mutual. Well, thanks everybody, as always, for listening. If you like the episode, the thing that we really appreciate more than anything, as you know, is please just share this episode with a friend or colleague that you, that you think would like it. And if you're feeling really generous, then you can leave us a review on your favorite podcast player. And with that, we will see you next time. That wraps up this week's episode of the Genetics Podcast. I'd like to give a huge thank you to our guests for sharing their valuable insights and experience. And thank you as well to our listeners, as always, for tuning in. If you enjoyed today's talk, the number one thing I would really appreciate from you is if you could share it with a friend or colleague who you think would enjoy it as well. We would also really appreciate if you could subscribe to our show and give us a quick rate and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. Both of these things help us become more visible when people search for genetics and precision medicine podcasts. And we're always eager to hear from you. Please reach out to us with any questions or feedback on social media. You can find Sonogenetics on Twitter, LinkedIn, or visit sonogenetics.com. Finally, a big thank you to the team behind the scenes who make all this possible. In particular, Amy Cousins and Sonia Shah who produced the show, and James Pierce from Selective Frequencies who handles the audio engineering. I'm Patrick Short, your host, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you, and we'll see you next time on the Genetics Podcast.